Board of Public Works. It's uh, May 14th, 2014. And the first order of business is public comment. What do you look at me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing even writing now because oh, nice. they might be reviewed again instead of just being blown off. Uh, Board of Public Works currently has a policy of self-sufficient funding for the Locust Street and Glendale Road transfer stations. The operation of these sites is supposed to be totally paid for with fees collected from stickers and bag sales. A number of board members have openly expressed their philosophy that operation of these two locations should cease if they do not break financially even each year. Recent trash, recycling, and composting events have raised the question of whether this philosophy is proven in light of the fact that they're available to many residents, and in some cases non-residents, who currently make no contribution to the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. Recent community tag sales an example in point. Of the four, four or five participants in this event, only two of their vehicles had Enterprise Fund stickers, and one participant appeared to be a dealer. This event involved the attendance of the Solid Waste Coordinator and one staff member for the entire Saturday morning. Were their salaries paid for by resident sticker and bag purchasers? With the rain in the forecast, should this event have been canceled to save money? A similar situation occurred with the recent garden pot collection and swap, which was available to all residents, including participants from out of town. The question arises as to who participates in these activities who benefits and where does the money come from to pay for them? Is it fair and proper for sticker and bag buyers to pay for these operations while many others benefit? Only one member of the Public Works Board, who unfortunately is leaving, has raised the question of the community service value of the above activities and whether their funding should be supplemented by sources other than the sticker and bag fees. The Solid Waste Enterprise Fund has income from gas sales and cell tower rent which could easily supplement trash and recycling expenses. It is time for the board members to accept the fact that the transfer stations and recycling are valuable community services. Continually raising the sticker and bag fees to the point of residents opting out may achieve a member's personal goal of getting out of the trash business, but it will terminate a service in which hundreds of residents are regularly involved. Okay. Um, I, what, I'd like a motion to take uh, the departure of one of our board members out of order. So moved. Second. Uh, so Chris came to Northampton, I think, four years ago? I, I was here. born and raised here, but I returned in 2007. Seven. So, okay. So uh, five or six years ago. Um, worked at National Priorities Project for a while. Left there. Has become, hopefully in part due to this process, more interested in municipal government than uh, the, the larger picture federal government. And he's not going to work for the mayor, as I think you all know. So this is not only his last meeting, it's his last 10 minutes, I think, <laughs> at the board. <laughs> and Chris, it's been a lot of fun having you on the board. You've, you've made a nice contribution. Thanks. Uh, we, I think we all appreciate it. Thanks. Um, yeah, if I could just say a couple words. Uh, um, it is actually my participation in, in this work and, and other uh, city commissions that um, convinced me that uh, a change in careers, even at this point in my life, was what I wanted to do. And um, uh, to the extent that I have any regrets about the move, um, leaving this commission would, would be probably one of the very few. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed working with all of you. I think I've made some friends here. I hope you'll continue to uh, stay in touch with me. Both, Obviously, some of you will have to professionally, <laughs> but uh, um, personally, and um, um, I really value the work that you do here, and, and I, as I said, I valued it so much, I decided it was something that I wanted to do full-time. Um, we, we do, and we can make a difference, and I think that that's important. So thank you all again for your support. I really enjoyed my time here. Have cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> A highly portable moment. <laughs>
Can we express some thanks to him? Oh, yes. It, the, yes. Individual you didn't thoughts? Like what Carrie said? Well, I did, thank, but I just wanted to supplement it that I really yeah. appreciated your participation. You come thoroughly prepared to do research, you engage, and you ask some of the most thoughtful and thought provoking questions that we have. And I really appreciate that and we'll miss it, but I'm delighted that that guidance is going to the mayor's office. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, because then we'll can still continue to benefit as citizens. Did you make this? <laughs> Me and Betty. Would you like a cupcake? Anybody else? There's plenty. All right. We'll work on it through the meeting. Okay. We need all these sad cupcakes because we're sad to see him go, but happy for his new career. Because you have said over and over again how it's really fascinated you. Yeah. I wanted to delve into it myself. You know, it's. <laughs> Kudos to you. It's one of these things where um, I used, when I was a kid, I used to think I was really cool. And then I was reading this article once about the effects of inflation on the Apache helicopter program. And as I got further into the article, the reporter said, but this is only of real interest to inside the Beltway budget geeks. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> now you're going to be outside the Beltway budget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's already it's already been really exciting, and as I said, I think I think half of the the, the DPW has already been up to see me in one form or another, so that's been good. We were there on business. We weren't getting coffee downtown or anything. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's not we got that new sidewalk <laughs> or the space between the sidewalks. <laughs> I think one of Chris's first adventures was private ways. The public hearings that we had. Yep. Going yeah. to all of those. Yeah. And then one of the first things, one of my first duties in the mayor's office was helping him draft the, uh, the mayor's proclamation for uh, National Public, Public Works Week. So, uh, which, who's going to get it? Pick it up tomorrow? Jim's going to get it. Good. Mm -hmm. So, mayor I'm had help. I'm sure it will be fine. Well, Ned wrote most of it. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I'm sure it will be <laughs> So, anyhow, thank All right. you. Well, thanks again, Chris, and leave, stay as long as you'd like. You're just like a member of the public now. I know. <laughs> You're always welcome to stay. You, would you like to make any comments yeah. as a member of the public? No. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, next uh, minutes of the April 23rd board meeting for your approval. I have approval. Have any, has anyone commented who cared to comment? Mr. Parsons already did. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. All in favor of accepting them as amended by Mike Parsons? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next, the minutes of the April 16th BPW meeting. Move approval. Second. Mr. Any Parsons things? already commented. Nicely done. <laughs> All in favor of accepting these as amended? Aye. Great. Aye. <laughs> Um, okay, we are, we've been blessed this evening with the presence of Wayne Fiden, who's here to give us a, uh, some additional perspective on Boggy Meadow Road and its suitability as a city street. Can I pass these out? Um, there's one each, there's uh, nine copies, so I might be shy, but can count? We can share. Okay. So, <coughs> so, so share that. Council Commission asked me not to accept Boggy Meadow Road as a street. So these two things are sort of background for, for the reasons that recommendation. Um, so the first, the newer map, is a map done by uh, on the front by Associates in 1989, showing Boggy Meadow Road. You see the note. This was some of you may remember if you're here forever. So there's a project called Hidden Oak Estate. It's going to be a subdivision that proposed in 1987, 88. It's going to be off of Coles Meadow Road, and they're going to use Boggy Meadow Road as the back way in. We don't allow subdivisions for the dead end is more than, at the time, 800 feet, now 500 feet. So they couldn't do the project unless they could show two means of access. They had access from Coles Meadow Road. They wanted to use Boggy Meadow Road, and they spent a lot of time researching the title and couldn't find title to Boggy Meadow Road. The survey from Huntley came afterwards that sort of basically documents that. Record City Engineering, don't show it's, it's now or ever was accepted as a street. It is a right-of-way that's 40 feet wide. So a lot of deeds refer to it, 
a lot of properties go up to that, and there is actually a land court plan for a portion of it that shows a sliver of land 40 feet wide. So it is a separate parcel, um, but it doesn't appear to be, a, it never was a road at all. Um, and I think we always have a concern about roads becoming roads without going through the subdivision process. So as a sort of philosophical standpoint, it's not something that, that should be a road there. Um, and in particular, because the Conservation Commission abuts Boggy Meadow Road for um, basically the entire uh, western side of it. Um, what's called the Derelict Fee Statute says it is a piece of property which nobody owns, all the abutters own to the center line of the road. So Conservation Commission's position is that they own the center line of Boggy Meadow Road. That all the abutters to Boggy Meadow Road have the right to pass and repass. That there's no attempt to try to block those, but it's not available to the general public, just the, the property owners and, and their invitees. Um, so there's a gate at the beginning, a, a little bit up into Boggy Meadow Road that's always open, um, and there's a gate further back. But this, as soon as the Conservation Commission owns on both sides of Boggy Meadow Road, that's where you put the second gate back. The second plan is an earlier plan. This goes back to 1947. Um, and this is of, so parcel A on this is the, the, the Moose Lodge. Um, and it clearly shows that their property goes up to Boggy Meadow Road, doesn't go into Boggy Meadow Road. And you'll notice that their southerly property boundary, their southeasterly property boundary, is the edge between Cook Avenue and Boggy Meadow. So as far as we can tell from this plan, it's the only record we have, so this isn't the DPW numbers, but as of 1947, Cook Avenue ended right at the beginning of the Moose Lodge, and that's where Boggy Meadow begun, begins. So Wayne, their pins are on the southern edge of Boggy Bed, 40 foot. Southwestly right? edge, right. Yeah. Okay. And then if you go back to the earlier plan, you see where the Moose Lodge lines up. So the Moose Lodge is southeasterly, a southwesterly corner basically lines up with the northerly part of Pine's Edge. What I couldn't find in the half hour before I came here was the final street acceptance for Pine's Edge. But I believe when Pine's Edge was accepted, you extended Cook Avenue basically by 20 feet. So where that lip is that widens out of Pine's Edge, Cook Avenue, which used to go up to the southerly edge of the Moose Lodge, now goes 10 feet, 20 feet, whatever it is. The issue you probably know is their education exemption, they're sort of exempt. So they, the Moose Lodge could remain forever. They can sell it to, you know, someone for affordable housing. They can sell it for religious uses. They can sell it for education uses, none of which require additional frontage. But if it gets developed for anything else, then they need, need frontage. And they could do the subdivision process. I'm not arguing against them. Okay. So th they have, there's a remedy available to them if they want to go through the full... Uh, wait a second. I spoke too soon. So there's a remedy available to them in terms of going for 40B per much allows affordable housing, doing education uses, or doing religious uses. We, because we have this 500 foot dead-end street requirement, and that's from the nearest place where the street isn't a dead-end, mm -hmm. then no, we wouldn't allow a subdivision to extend the okay. street further out because it's dead-end. Okay. So this is all relevant to our street hearing uh, about a month ago, and whether or not we would recommend. So the <coughs> petition has been presented to the board, the city council. They've referred it to us for our our thoughts, recommendation uh, as to whether or not we would recommend they accept it. And so this is the point where I have a few questions. Sure, I, Wayne. I'm. I guess I'm s still not sure who we believe owns the 40-foot right-of-way, or is that is that a distinctly separate parcel and and the abutters? Because there's no record, owner of record? That's right, so everyone's property line goes, everyone's property goes up to it, so in theory it's a separate parcel. Yep. But 20 or 30 years ago, state legislature passed this derelict fee statute. Okay. Which says you can't have property that's not owned by anybody, and so if it doesn't own anybody, everyone goes to the center. We're dealing with this now for Kirkland Avenue. We've dealt with it for Van and Railroad rights away. We've dealt with it for the, for the river that used to go through downtown. In all those cases, we assume the property line is the center line of it. So doesn't that appear to invalidate your point about the, this older survey that their property extends up to but not into the 40 feet? So I think that they, 
this per, this is correct for what they own by deed, and then yes, an additional 20 feet okay. is what they'd own under the Darrell Street Statute. It, to some extent, frankly, that extra 20 feet is moot because since everybody has a right to pass and repass on it, you couldn't prevent anybody from doing it, but nobody could prevent them either. So they have a guaranteed right to get in using that 40 feet. Mm -hmm. We could not block that off, but everybody else does as well. Or everyone else and, sure. So. And, and that it's that right of access that allows the public to get into the Fitzgerald Lake property? That's correct. Okay. Anything else, Mike? No. Does anyone else have any other questions? So we're leading up to a vote on whether or not to recommend that the city council accept the street. Terry, that's not on the agenda of the recommendation tonight. It was for Wayne to come and talk about oh. the road. Okay. I was planning to have that at the next meeting as a recommendation. <coughs> so property owners want to show up for that. You have plenty of time to think about this between now and the next meeting. Do you have any other questions for Wayne? No, nope. I'm all set. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take a cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, is it hard to just listen? Terry? Yeah. <laughs> I remember before I was here. <laughs> yeah. um, what, are you here for a particular... I'm actually here just to learn more about how these meetings work. Sweet. All right. Yeah, well, we're right <laughs> 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 I don't need to say anything. <laughs> okay. Well, you're welcome. And uh, so if you have a pithy question or something, I'll do it. And if you figure out how they work, if you could let us know. <laughs> 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 That's the key. <laughs> Was it, was it she was aware that something on the agenda was changed and that, that, that was pending moved up to six. Yeah, I told her. Okay. Let's just wait. Thank you, Chris. 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 Thank Pavement projects in 2014. I'm, I'm here to observe. Oh, so you're. I'm just here for the meeting. To okay. Try to figure out comments on that. So actually. I just forgot. Um, all right. Well, then let's talk about uh, the use of campaigning and leafleting at the Locust Street Transfer Station. One of the city councilors, I think you may have seen, had a question about. Um, Question. Yes. Councilor Carney was up here doing a solicitation, and um, basically, she didn't realize we had a permit process here, and she had a form of disagreement with one of our gatekeepers up there also about the matter. So I received a phone call on a Friday or Saturday about it, and uh, told Councilor Carney that she needed a permit, and the activity that she was doing was against the board policy for here. Uh, Jim had a conversation with Maureen and the gatekeeper. I talked to the gatekeeper, and I uh, believe Jim was actually looking to talk about this also tonight, about uh, whether or not we change the, the actual campaign leafleting to allow for some use down towards the compactor area rather than designated parking areas up here, because they're not catching the flow of the people or the traffic. Mm -hmm. um, the big concern that we had when we created this was people running in around vehicles and cars and so on and maybe the thought is that we change the policy so maybe there is a area they can stand or confined area they can be in to do that activity closer to the people that they want to interact with rather than a big distance away. Um, so I just had a question about these policies and wanted to see if the board wanted to consider making any changes to them. I don't really care one way or another. I did talk to Councilor Carney about what happened. Um, she's basically looking to get signatures on a nomination form. Anyone that's done this realizes it's sort of a difficult task to, to find a location where there are multitudes of people to sign something. So she was here and um, you know what happened is that, you know, as Ned described it, but I guess my question is um, it didn't seem like getting signatures for nomination form exactly are addressed by these uh, solicitation or campaigning leafleting policies as they were written. 
and whether the board wanted to consider allowing someone with a clipboard to ask people to sign a piece of paper closer to the area of the recycling center. Um, I use the recycling center, I come in, I am offered raffle tickets for uh, different things, I'm offered uh, Girl Scout cookies which I shouldn't eat, and I'm offered all kinds of things in an activity at a table right by the recycling center. So I'm wondering if someone is, has a clipboard and they're looking for signatures for a nomination form, whether that is so different than some of the other activities that happen up there and not down here, because the way the policy is written, these sort of political campaigning, leafletting activities are opposite the admin building and a location where people may, it, it'll be difficult to get people to sign nomination forms because they're not going to stop. So that was it. I just wanted to see if the board wanted to talk about that or consider it or just forget about it. Uh, well, up to you. Is there any state legislation around getting signatures? I mean, it's just, you're just walking around um, getting the public to sign on, right? I mean, th there's nothing mandated or limiting, but there's, I mean, it's just a public. Whether you're singing songs or emptying trash or getting signatures, if you're just doing it for your own benefit, not selling or not proselytizing, there's no limitations, right? I'm not aware of well, that's I actually know nothing about this. <coughs> I think so be up beyond what happens here. When we did the policy to begin with, there was some it was some heated issue. So the issue, the issue well, no, no, but there's an issue that we're trying to, to stagger people so we didn't have right. the Ku Klux Klan and the NCAA and it's simultaneously it's trying to be in the same place. We're trying to... No basketball. No basketball. Yeah. No basketball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I call it a terrible example. <laughs> the, timing was, the timing was municipal uh, elections, right? So I yeah. think it was around the time now Mayor Narkowitz and, and uh, Councilor Bardsley, I think, were both of buying for space and there was uh, okay, concern yeah. about there, there were a lot and it wasn't I don't think it was just those two campaigns there were probably city council campaigns as well but everybody wanted to be there it was like all right well we have a problem because you know there's 20 people that want to be there and it was addressed pretty well through the policy mm -hmm. this just seemed like to me a nuance that maybe you know it's not campaign season it's just but you know, we let Girl Scout cookie tables be up there? Well, and I was yes. surprised by the table. I, I knew that we allowed fundraising, but when, the day I saw the table, I, I was curious if that sort of was beyond what we had envisioned or what we had thought we would allow. That we, you know, the kids with the tag sales and the fundraising we allowed, we wanted to continue to allow that to happen. But when there was a table out there, that just felt like a little bit more well, than I thought. I, then I have a hard time seeing what's distinct between that and having a politician at a table or leaflets? Or well, I think the idea was that there wouldn't be like a physical setup, that people who were on their feet moving around asking for money was one thing, or asking for signatures mm -hmm. could be one thing. But if they were, had a table, and they had campaign literature, or they had Girl Scout cookies, or they had you know something to, to sell as a fundraiser. The idea was to get them away from the, the right. dumpsters, because we wanted to have free flow of traffic and people back and forth because we knew that there was a bigger volume that would be coming in. So at least that was my recollection. So you think it would be reasonable to take another look at these policies? It sounds like the Girl Scout cookie table is falling into a funny well, if, gap if nothing yes, else. When I saw the Girl Scout I love Girl Scout cookies too, yeah. but it, it felt like they had set up sort of a stand there which set, felt a little different and felt like what we were trying to move away from with the campaign, because sometimes there were right. campaign tables and materials, and we wanted that away from the dumpsters and stuff. So My recollection on the campaigning piece of it was that those discussions can often take a fairly long amount of time, mm -hmm. and we didn't want people hanging around the transfer station area while they debated some political issue. And so I think that's why we decided up here in front of this building was a better place to do that. So political speech, as long as it's no longer than three minutes. Three well. minutes. I think. <laughs> let's go with three minutes, <laughs> and we'll give the attendant stopwatches. <laughs> uh, I like the table idea because that that kind of designates a space, and that I think it enhances the safety of the people doing the solicitation if they 
hang out around their table. But like they're not moving in another moving track. Yeah. Right. So. All right. <clears throat> I, I kind of agree with that, and I, I don't remember the details of the conversation, but I, it, I think, Mike, you hit on something that, that it, we wanted the political piece to move this way for some reason. I always thought the table was fine where it was, and honestly, I don't think, you, how could you sell cookies without having a stockpile? So I think the table's fine, and I, I really don't remember exactly why we thought that somehow the leafleting would be too confusing and you'd have people blocking traffic. I think that was what it was, mm -hmm. but I... Is it, is it okay if the Girl, Scout, Girl Scouts have a table up at that end? I'm fine with it. I, I, I think it's been like that for a very long time. But but as distinct yeah. from oh, that end being up near the dumpsters or yes. down where we've been putting. So the, the Girl Scout table was up toward the dumpsters. It was mm -hmm. near the big paper. So the end of the compactor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and the, the compactor box. Right? Yeah, is that a, 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 and the rationale for not letting a politician have a table in the set location is that political issues are different than Girl Scout fundraising. Things? I mean, I, I that's a, that's the part I really don't recall. I, I thought it was just the duration of the I discussion. Think yeah. I think you're probably that's, right. That's well, the only yeah. piece I can. Well, I don't, I don't understand this. So, you know, when you read the policy, it says spaces for solicitation shall take part of it. it. Says spaces for solicitation shall take place in the vicinity of the gatekeeper's building, and at their discretion for actual location pending activities to be expected, which seems to indicate that the gatekeepers somehow in the policy we've given the gatekeepers some leeway to determine what type of activity they th think is going to be okay hap happening up there. Mm -hmm. So maybe, um, it, you know, it seems like it needs some clarity whether mm -hmm. in some way, because we're giving a lot of discretion to gatekeepers, and if it was someone yeah. looking for signatures... <laughs> and he, she, he exercised his discretion. Right. Unfortunate and, results. Right, but this whole thing about the political, and maybe Ned can speak to this, because I, I don't actually ever get involved in this stuff, except that it, it seems like there was something wrong here that needs to be addressed. But I, t I talked to uh, to Deb today about about this issue about getting signatures on nomination forms, and she said other people have looked to do this recently, but because it's been called political, they've been told to come up outside the administration building where it doesn't work to get signatures on nomination forms. So to me, it's like, do we want to address this specific issue in a way that says if it's political, so it's political, they're told that they have to be right up here, but they want to be down there. Is it okay if they're down there, even though it's political, if they get behind the table? I mean, that seems like the clarification that would be necessary. Whether do you think it's acceptable to do that or not? In other words, does all political activity have to be removed from the station? Can we authorize the staff to review the policy and make a Recommendation. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just raise another issue? I, I remember the issue of congestion. Mm -hmm. I remember the I issue of um, what I'm not sure of is were we concerned about uh, simultaneous. I mean, I remember talking about she should be limited to at the time. It is limited. It is limited. It's it's limited. limited to it two. Is. It is limited. Oh, it is limited. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't read it. Yeah. So it's limited to two. So Maureen could be up here and the flight could be up here, but no more until the next week. And they'd have to sign up differently. Right. But you could look at all of that if you see. <coughs> There's time blocks, right? Inconsistencies or anything that yeah, yeah. could be. Okay. I'd love it. I'll jump on it tomorrow. <laughs> <I'm all straight laughs> <now>. <laughs> Okay. Over the weekend is fine. I mean, I don't feel like you got it. Awesome. What about overtime? Um, all right. Uh, claims committee for 110 Fern Street. Oh, we have three of these. What's 1 King Street? Uh, Silverscape? Yes. So we have three of them. Uh, how much time do we need? Probably 15, 20 minutes per each one. Mm. One king might be harder, though. Yeah, there's a bigger issue back there. Mm. Well, part part of this discussion is the last three claims meetings, nobody has shown up. And so are we communicating with the public about showing up or not showing up? Because if they don't show up, then we need less time. 
I send them a letter telling them when the meeting is. Um, Nuttleman's, I, I knew that they weren't, well, she asked me last week if we had had the meeting already. I said, no, the meeting's not till this week. Right. But generally, in other claims, they haven't shown up. Some pe most people do, but sometimes they do just you, don't. Do you think if we, if we set the time to talk to them, we should say, if you don't come, we'll postpone until you can come? We'll reschedule. Or, or not. I mean, My only concern about that is that we treat everybody the same. Yeah. I think it also depends on the claim. I mean, it was very easy to um, honor right. this particular claim once you read the facts. And so, without knowing the facts, it's hard to know if it matters if they come or not. Okay. Do you want me to add a sentence to the letter stating the board likes to speak to you directly about the Well, that's what I was kind of asking, just asking. But maybe what we could, we could, we could do it more quickly. Um, and if we have questions, we can refer it back to the person and say, we had questions, you'll, you'll have to come. We just have. Hmm. Well, what, uh, that seems like that'd be hard on the staff because then they have more communication with them. I think if, if you're going to send out a letter, why not send out a letter saying that you're invited to come, but it's not necessarily a requirement. However, if we have questions and you're not here and to answer them, we'll table it. It may it may be tabled until it you may be tabled. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> until we can get the information we need. Right. How what do you think about that, BJ? Yeah. Because because I think you're right. It's it's um. Some are really clear cut. We don't need mm -hmm. to yeah. talk to them right, to have right. them come out here just to say, oh yeah, we agree right. with you. Yeah. I don't want them to come yeah. just for the sake of coming. Exactly. I don't want them to penalize them. But we were, we were deferring it for a while. There, when people didn't show up, and it's now true. we've relaxed and relaxed a little bit. Well, especially if the claim is, if we agree, it's, it's yeah. our issue. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's our fault. So back to these particular claims, you're saying that some of them are going to be longer than others. I think one came maybe. The other two should be pretty straightforward. Yeah. How about if we do 5 o'clock King Street and then 520 and 525? But you already have something May 28th, don't you? Yes. Road acceptance, street acceptance, right? Yeah. yeah. Three of them. So it's and I think you already have something in... Do you have something in June yet? I don't think you've gotten into June yet. Okay. Yeah, I don't have anything on the 11th yet. Yeah. Okay. So June 11th for which one? Two or just the one? Um, well, let, let's, so do you mind coming at five? Not, not so seven. we'll come at five. Let's do one King Street first. And then if the others are pretty simple, we could schedule them both for quarter after and Two after. <coughs> or, you know, something like that. Okay. It should be quarter after and one third after. One third after? Yes. Okay. <coughs> so, one ten, Burn Street at 515 and 120 ish? Yeah. 520, 520, excuse me. 522 and a half. That's, that's and this easy. is uh, Put that into a fraction very easily. Hollow Street. One third is easy. And this is on June 11th. Okay. Yes. Okay. According to my notes. Okay. <coughs> um, next, uh, change order number two to contract 30-14 for dam repairs on the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam Design and Permitting. I didn't read that very well. Uh, to GZA Geoenvironmental in the amount of 24550 And this will be paid for by the Water Enterprise Fund. Move approval. Second. It's a change order for the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam Removal Project, which um, has sort of an evolving scope of work. Um, 
when we started to do early permitting coordination with the various state and federal agencies, they had indicated that they wanted sediment managed from the dam prior to its removal in a certain way. And since that time, the, their opinions are evolving in terms of what mitigation is necessary for sediment management. So we spent some money. They, our original scope was, was identified um, the solution that the regulators originally told us they wanted us to use, and now they're telling us they want us to do something else. So all these scope changes involve some deletion of scope items that were relative to the, the way we we're going to manage sediment at the beginning and adding some scope items for the new direction that the regulators are telling us that they now want us to do. Um, so we've incurred some costs because of this particular issue and um, that's reflected in here by the increase um, in some, I, I think overall the, the change will be better. I think the, the fact that we didn't get the answer we wanted from the regulators at the beginning was a little problematic, but the fact that we're getting the answer now that we had hoped originally we think is good. Um, in we're going to save much more money than this. We're hoping we'll save. We're hoping we'll save money um, in the end with the constru with construction dollars, right? Because yeah. of the change. So, uh, who, are the, who are the regulators? Is this the uh, Office of Dam Safety? No, actually, they're they're pretty straightforward. They just like take the dam down. How you do it is they leave up to all the other regulators. Mm -hmm. So it's the Army Corps of Engineers. It's DEP, um, Conservation Commission. Uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife, uh, Natural Heritage Program, all the various. The question has a lot to do with what to do with all the <coughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All in favor of. Oh, I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay. All right. All in favor of approving this adjustment to the contract? Aye. 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 Change order number two to contract 168 14 to Boards Construction for the Bradford Street Force Main Replacement in the amount of $2,054. And also we want to extend the contract to August 31st. Uh, and this is a sewer enterprise project. Second. Change order two for the Woodmont Road Force Main. Um, the Force Main's on Woodmont Road. It comes from the Bradford Street Pump Station. Um, this change order is a credit of $2,054.25. And it's essentially, um, sort of a balancing change order where we're taking credit for materials we didn't use uh, in the contract and we're applying some of the money for um, doing an overlay in Woodmont Road, which is sort of a disaster to come down there. We've been doing work on the pump station and this ripping up the road to the forest main. And originally the contract allowed for um, permanent trench patch only where the forest main was built, so we're going to do an overlay of the street to try to leave it in a little better condition. So. This change order accomplishes that. Okay. Any questions about this? No. All in favor of approving this change order? Aye. 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 Great. Um, how are we doing? Are, are you here for the uh, reuse center? How are we doing as far as the group you expected to re get here tonight? I think some people I think, think we're it's. Still waiting for Susan. Yeah. Susan yeah. yeah. Okay. Some people think it's 6:30. I think. Right. That's probably right. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, next, the contract for forestry consulting services to Michael Mori and the amount of no. number six. Oh. Wood debris. Sorry. Wood debris. Contract for wood debris removal to Northern Tree Service in the amount of fifty-three thousand six hundred out of the general fund money. Second. We have a wood waste holding facility off of Sylvester Road, um, <clears throat> historic one. It's pretty much filled to capacity at this point, and so we put out a bid to solicit to, for the removal of all the butt logs and everything else that's up there and get it removed out of there. We have four bidders on the project. Low bidder was Northern Tree at 53.6. High bidder was Cotton Tree at $108,500. So um, we were actually able to encumber some money from last year, $35,000 for this project. The bids came in. I had a discussion with the mayor and um, we're paying for the rest of this out of our general fund budget this year. And that way we start with a clean site. So we'd like to keep using it. We would like to, we have no other place to store this material. Okay. And um, we can't open burn it, so I need to hire someone to take it away. So there's no way we can use it for mulch or have it. Um, these are these are huge diameter logs. Some of these logs are 50 inches. 
Have they stumps also? No. no. There's no stumps. No, we grind all the stumps. Okay. And there's no market for the logs at all? Um, the mills won't take the logs as far as I know because of imperfections. They're street trees. Mm -hmm. They might have fencing in them. They might have, they're not native timber that's out in the woods. It's been, um, put a railroad spikes in it for benchmarks. Who knows mm -hmm. what's in there? Hmm. Over what duration has, have we accumulated this material? Okay. Rich, long time. Uh, probably ten years. But that's been cyclical because we used we. It's been ever since twenty five years I've been here. The place has been full. We've been using it all this time. We used to harvest uh, bank run gravel out of there, but we ran out of that material, so now we use it as a wood wood waste facility. Okay. All in favor of approving the contract for removing the logs? Aye. Aye. Now, contract for Forestry Consulting Services to Michael Moore in the amount of fifteen thousand four hundred dollars for the Water Enterprise Fund. Second. The contract with our licensed forester to help us out with um, consulting tasks related to land management that we do. Um, essentially, the the tasks that we've asked assistance uh, from Mike on, including uh, they include. Um, Task one is outreach efforts, so um, helping us perform uh, walks and tours of the active forest management work that we're doing, um, assistance in the development of outreach materials that, we, uh, that we're working on. Task two is monitoring documentation and maintenance of areas, including um, existing DCR-proof forest stewardship plans. So we're working on developing documentation and monitoring of areas that we're currently logging. So ways to document um, what's happening on these on the uh, the work areas over time um, doing things like uh, preparing required annual green certification monitoring reports that we have to submit to, to uh, DCR Mike's also providing us with some assistance in um, coming up with a plan to deal with the thin vegetation um, with the problems with wild grape vines and oriental bittersweet in the in the forest so some things that we're actively working on things like that Task three is related to preparation of forest stewardship plans for newly acquired parcels. So for parcels that we're in the process of acquiring, we've got to get those incorporated into our overall stewardship plans. And the last task we've asked for is just miscellaneous forest consulting. Um, so for things that may come up that we may need his help on, it's, uh, it allows us to, to call him and have, have him help us. And that may include um, looking at forest-related work on on properties that um, we may acquire in the future uh, or doing timber appraisals on property that we don't own that we're thinking about buying and things like that. So he's given us an estimate of $15,411.90, um, which would, uh, is estimated to last about a year. It should be sort of an annual consulting style contract. So is this a uh, an hourly or a day rate? It is. Multiplied by an estimated number of days? It is. Yeah, exactly. Any questions about this? All in favor of approving the contract for the uh, forester? Aye. 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 Great. Uh, next uh, for your consideration, an agreement to accept the drinking water supply protection grant for a four-acre parcel in West Waitley in the amount of $36,450. This would um, help purchase a property, I think, right? Uh, for the water enterprise fund. Move approval. Yes, so this was a grant that we got notified the last minute they had some extra funds available. And so Nicole pursued this. This is a picture percent match grant for the Rose Culver Blanco parcel. So it's a nice little find. Yeah. Nice that they came back. I do recall this is on Sanderson Brook, uh, pretty close to the West Waitley Reservoir. Mm -hmm. Comments? Questions? All in favor of accepting this grant? Aye. Aye. Great. Coming in. Uh, next, a contract for design, permitting, and construction management for the uh, Roberts Meadow Channel improvements to GCA and Q Environmental in the amount of $115,000. This is coming out of the Water Enterprise Fund, but we're getting 
reimbursed for 75% of it? This is a 75% grant reimbursement project that we applied for in 2010, I believe it was, that finally became obligated this past year. Uh, Jim has been working with the consultants to nail down the design and uh, construction administration costs on this, and I'll let him present that. So the FEMA grant application was based on the construction of a 300, about a 350-foot long um, concrete wall, which would be constructed just downstream of the Musanti Beach Dam. So um, if you may remember, well, Terry knows this well because he was showing this picture all around town at the end of the year. But there's a um, significant stream erosion happening along the bank, just um, downstream of where the Musanti Beach is. Um, so the, the contract in front of you tonight is with G, uh, GZA, Geo Environmental, and they would develop design plans and secure all the permits and do construction administration for the construction of this wall in that stream bed. So they'll give us a biddable design? That is correct. All package. Yes, the whole thing, including um, construction administration services. So. Oh, I'm sorry, MJ. Uh, any estimate of the cost of construction? Yes. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head? No. But look! Look at this. And it's flagged, I'm sure, because I wanted to be to show everybody what I knew. Um, $428,275. So the, I do know because Mike Parsons told me that the percentage of construction is 33% for the engineering contract. Um, I'm sure I know what that number was. Which is high, right? It is high. So as Jim said, I, I, took, I took a look at this in some detail, and um, there are some rules of thumb for how much engineering should be as a percentage of construction costs. Um, the rules of thumb uh, work better with large value projects, and this really isn't a large value construction project. And in particular, this is a, a project that's really heavy into permitting. It's building a concrete wall along a stream. There are lots of regulatory agencies that have their say in something like this. So the percentages don't provide a lot of guidance. So I, I looked at the effort that they've carried and it seems pretty reasonable to me, although the end result ends up at, at a high percentage. Um, the one thing that caught my eye that um, I've talked with Jim about a little bit is they've carried resident engineering services at a rate of $75 an hour, but with no guarantee that when um, we get to to construction, they'll be able to find someone to do the work at that rate, which is a risk I don't think we should undertake solely on our, on our own as the city. And so I was suggesting to Jim that, that perhaps we could get GZA to commit to the $75 an hour rate um, for the 2015 construction season, and that if the project's delayed Beyond that, then I think it would be reasonable to adjust it by some consumer price index number, but um, try to get us some protection on, on that particular number. And did that seem reasonable? Absolutely. In fact, if you're comfortable with that, you could probably approve the contract tonight with that stipulation as a condition, and I can make sure that it, it gets added to the contract. So then I'll offer an amendment to the motion that, that our approval be contingent upon the resident engineering rate being $75 an hour for the 2015 construction season um, adjusted after that based on the consumer price index provided the delay is not the fault of the engineer. Is there a second on that I said amendment? Second. I just have one more question. I know that when we did the Bradford Street pump station, I recall that there was some a similar issue, and I think we ended up hiring somebody who was retired from Stan Tech to be the resident engineer, and I think that worked out really well for the city in a lot of ways, including the financial. Is, would that option still be available under this contract? Uh, it would be possible. 
but there's no guarantee. Right, but it just seemed like there may be another option that would be possibly even better. If, as long as, in other words, if we get them to agree to lock in the price at $75 an hour for 2015, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to actually take them up on that service. Is that right? That's Because that's it's really very specific to a yeah. particular tap. That's right. I mean, having it locked in with a CPI, I think, makes great sense. I do, too. Um, normally, yeah, it's a, it's a little aggravating that it, it's the, the way they worded it, that it's not... I mean, usually it's sort of guaranteed. I mean, this is your proposal. These are the fees. These are the rates you're going to charge. Right. And, and typically, it'd be their engineer. Normally. Yeah. All right. So we have. So the contract is to um, do all of the design, permitting, and construction management for the retaining wall south or downstream from Musanti Beach. The river is actually eroding towards the house. His trees are starting to. There's your photo. Yeah. Did we see that when we went out on the uh, private way visits? Uh, I don't I think so. I don't know, but it was on the storm. Wasn't this the storm water? Uh, this was slide. a poster child project, among others. <laughs> yeah. So, because that whole area is historically water supply, we're calling it a water. Uh, enterprise fund project. Um, we're sort of saddled with that that section of the river uh, because it was once part of our primary water supply. Um, all right, all in favor of approving the contract? Aye. Aye. Um, all right, next we have uh, a couple of things that we're not all right, we're going to reschedule the stewardship plan presentation from the Forester. Yeah. Uh, an update on the 2015 budget. Yeah. Was there a date of rescheduling that? There was not. That's why okay. I'm, Nicole was supposed to get me some dates from Mike, and, and I haven't seen them yet. So. Table it? The, yeah, table it. But, table but, but, to reschedule. Table to reschedule. <laughs> but cancel the May 28th, right? So Mike was going to come in on May 28th at that board meeting oh. to talk about the student plans. Okay. And uh, he's not available that date, so it's I apologize for that. Well, now that we've uh, approved his new contract, we'll be... I'd be more anxious to oh, yeah. 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 I can see that. <laughs> so, Ned, would you like to talk about the budget? Yes, there's been two changes to the budgets that the board approved to go going forward. The first one is the Landfill Enterprise Fund. These were changed by the mayor's office. The first change on the landfill, or the change on the landfill enterprise, was we were trying to pay off the closure of the unlined landfill. Uh, we had debt service that goes out to 2017 in that, and we were trying to pay it off this year. That's not going to happen, so it's been rolled into next year. So the change that's going to happen, there, there won't be the transfer of $564,838 to pay that off. It's going to roll into next year. So what it does, it shows a, a larger potential loss from the enterprise fund from $134,944 to a loss of $681,261. By moving this into um, FY15, we're able to save about $15,000 or $17,000 on the debt service schedule by paying it off. And that's why we're doing this, so we save that $17,000. There's no net change of what we're doing. It's just doing it in a different fiscal year. Oh, we're moving it. We're, we're doing it closer. Right. We were trying to get it done this year. This FY14 is not yeah. going to happen. So it just rolls in next year. And because it changes your total expenditures of your landfill enterprise fund, it doesn't change the total revenue being received. It just shows a bigger deficit. That's and does all. that five hundred thousand come out of the approximately one million one hundred thousand surplus? Uh, no, that's above and beyond the surplus. This, this is, is in the. In the uh, this the is already in the FY fourteen budget to be done. Okay. So it's being moved into FY fifteen. That's the change. Okay. All right. So it doesn't change the cash reserves that we have. Okay. The second one is the stormwater and flood control enterprise fund. Uh, the mayor's office did not recognize the FEMA grant as a funding source. We had that to reduce it to under the $2 million budget, so they took that out. 
So at the end, the end budget doesn't change of $1.98 million that had come through here, but they took out that there was a FEMA funding source for revenue of roughly $64,000 and change. So that's changing on the debt OOM and the interest OOM in that budget. So it, the net, like I said, the, there is no change in our total budget of $1.98 million. They just moved it to a different line item. Uh, it's been taken out because there's no guarantees that that money is going to come in FY15. That's oh, so it does raise the overall expenditures by 64. It actually decreases it by 64 because it's not considered to be a revenue source coming in. So original okay. expenditures were 2.1 million and change. It is now 1.98 and change. And prior you had 120,600 coming in as a revenue source through the FEMA grant funding, which has now been changed to 60, uh, that's been changed out. So that's the difference, is the funding source. And so we're, we're reducing some of our income. Are we also reducing some of, I mean, how had we planned to spend that money? In other words, isn't it a balanced? We assume that we've had this theme of grant coming in that is unsure that that's going to happen on this particular one. And we're going to use that money for something. This is the River Road Retaining Wall Project. Yes. So the River Road, so the, we may bring in less money, we may spend less money. Mm -hmm. Oh, the same one. Yeah. yeah. So those are the two changes that came down from the mayor's office. And I need to tell you that. Uh, uh, can I move that we take um, item number uh, three and the old business out of order? Yes. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Aye. Okay. We use proposal people. You have the floor. Wow. All right. Um, Susan, do you want to start? Sure. So as, as you Has each... Everybody um, met Susan? Yeah. No. Maybe you take a moment to introduce yourselves. <laughs> Okay, Susan, you first. I'm Susan Wade. I'm serving as recycling coordinator here in the city of Northampton and have been for, has it been 12 months? Close. Um, Yikes. Yeah. It's been 12 one year. <laughs> Thank you very soon. Thank you. Okay. I've Mike, enjoyed it too. Mike Parsons, a board member. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Those will know me now. You're director of public works. Hi, Susan. Hi. 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 David Shearer. Hi. Bro, you are, bro. I'm Terry Colhane. Nice to meet you. Jerry Hartwell. And could you? Should we do us, Terry? Do you want to go? No. You're going to come. I'm Debbie Slavin. I'm on the reuse committee and I'm the art reuse coordinator. <clears throat> I'll jump in too. I'm Peter Rackenbush on the reuse committee and all those other wonderful folks. Mm -hmm. We've got it. Right here. I'm Joan Wiener on the Reeves Committee. Dick Kazowski, Citizen Observer. <laughs> <laughs> Deadlines are I won't put it I'm Mac Everett. I'm a Northampton yeah. resident and I've been on the Reeves Committee for about three and a half years. Uh, I'm David Starr. I'm on the Reeves Committee. Okay. So they always say that, um, I've always thought that the saying, it takes a village, is a really trite kind of saying, but I'm going to say it tonight anyway. <laughs> um, it's been really a, a pleasure to work with this diverse and talented group of people that make up the, the reuse committee. There's lots of different skills and abilities, and um, they are committed. Some of them have been um, involved with this project for I don't know, eight years maybe trying to get a swap shop going. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's been. Um, they're they're committed or committable, as I tell them. <laughs> <laughs> they fit in well um, with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it. This whole concept is something that is really getting support from the Department of Environmental Protection and and a bunch of other uh, organizations. There's a reuse consortium that started for the state of Massachusetts. Um, it's just a really big movement, and the 
most recent grant cycle for the Sustainable Materials Recovery Program grant has a point system for a new piece of the grant and you can get, a community can get additional points which will qualify <coughs> them for more funding if they meet certain criteria. And, and one of those criteria is do you have a swap shop? So um, it's clearly the, the directive from the DEP who's also involved in this reuse uh, um, consortium is that we want to promote reuse. And when you think about the, the concept of uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, the concept of reduce, reuse, recycle, they're in that order for a reason because that is the order in which they make the most effect. It's it, uh, on, uh, environmentally and, and with other issues as well. So if you reduce what you're consuming, if you re that's the best thing to do. If you reuse what you've already consumed, that's second best. And then recycling is third best because you're ne then um, obviously reusing the, um, the materials themselves. So we've uh, focused a lot on recycling, and this is kind of bumping it up the pyramid a little bit to reducing and reusing, so it's really exciting. Um, with that, I'm not going to talk for long because we have a bunch of talented folks, and um, David Starr and I think Mac Everett are going to go take walk you through some of the proposal. Um, I've started a, a bunch of nonprofits in Northampton in the eight years that I've lived here, and I had a meeting with Peter Cocut, our state representative, about four or five years ago, and he was laughing at me and some of my kind of idealistic uh, notions, and he said, you know, you should know that at the State House, they refer to Northampton as 37 and a half square miles surrounded by reality. <laughs> so uh, clearly, we are looked on as early adopters and, uh, and doing things a little differently than the rest of the state. In the case of the swap shop, as, as many of you know, the swap shop has been on the table for uh, 12 years that I know about, since 2002. A lot of different people have worked on it since before uh, I moved to town. But in this one case, Northampton is not an early adopter. We're actually playing catch up with the rest of the state. As Susan uh, uh, indicated, the state, for the first time, is looking to give grant money to municipalities uh, to start a swap shop or to continue uh, swap shop operations that they have. So that in and of itself, I think, shows that uh, the state is really looking toward uh, solid waste reduction opportunities, and they see swap shop, uh, take it or leave it sorts of institutions as, uh, as a piece of the puzzle. So um, I feel like we're in a, in a very, uh, you know, everything happens at, at a time for a reason. You know, it didn't happen in 2002, it didn't happen in 2008, 2012. I think we have an opportunity here, the time is right. Um, as Susan said, this is a village of volunteers. There are a lot of people that are um, invested in making a swap shop work in Northampton. And uh, as a business owner, I've been a business owner for 33 years, uh, the first thing you do when you start a business is you look into best practices. You see what other companies are doing in the business that you want to go into to learn from their mistakes as well as to learn from the things that they've done right. Uh, for the last four months, uh, this committee has been uh, exploring best practices in Durham, New Hampshire, in eastern Massachusetts, in western Massachusetts. Uh, so I feel like uh, we've really done our due diligence in terms of budgeting, in terms of staffing, in terms of operations. And uh, I'm going to let Mac talk to you a little bit about what he has found out through those best practices. Okay. <coughs> um, well, certainly one of the most critical pieces is staffing. And in the course of interviewing folks from other centers, we found out, and, and incidentally, they were pretty much all volunteer run, uh, as this one is intended to be. And the consensus among them was that really it took four to eight really solid core volunteers to make something like this work. And um, you know, I was doing a little head count before I came up tonight, and uh, I, I know we've got that number met. Uh, and I feel like uh, we also have a group of volunteers that are not only enthusiastic, but are seasoned through the long series of pop-up events that we've done. 
We've had a chance to plan and execute events. We've had a lot of interaction with the public. We've had a lot of problem solving so challenges come up and problem solving responses developed. And so I feel like um, we have a solid experiential base to go into this experience with. Um, we've also, as David alluded to, we've done we've done a bunch of homework and we've we've talked to people around New England who run these things and said, what are your biggest challenges and how do you deal with them? So, and as you might expect, many of the same issues which are outlined in our plan that you have came up over and over again and we, and many of the same solutions came up, although there was certainly creativity from area to area in terms of how they solve them. So we have done our homework in terms of, I think, making a pretty thorough study of the typical challenges that swap shops um, encounter and how the best ways to deal with them are. Um, not that we would necessarily run into all of them, but we feel like we have uh, a good base of information uh, in case we do encounter them. Um, and I think, you know, what comes through over and over again talking to people is that basically you need a set of protocols and a set of guidelines. You need a structure that has some flexibility in it, but also you need the people coming in there who are bringing things to you to have a clear sense of what's acceptable, what you're going to take, and what, you, what you're not going to take. And uh, that's basically solved by having um, a clear, it's not an anarchistic situation where people are running in with loads of stuff and dropping it and running, but there's a clear protocol for people who are trained volunteers to accept materials coming in to sort through what's acceptable and can be reused and to, in a polite and diplomatic manner, uh, tell folks that we can't take certain things. There may be alternatives and maybe, for example, a bulletin board of other potential um, users that we can refer them to. And really, you know, the, the, in terms of the large framework, this is intended to be a zero waste service. So we know, we understand that in the beginning we'll be going through a learning curve and there may be some trial and error, but we're, we have a, a very clear sense at this point of what we want to accept. And we don't really want to accept anything that doesn't have another potential end user. So someone, if someone brings in an item um, that we put in the center and it doesn't go, we have another... Uh, place to send it to, whether it's the Salvation Army or the Goodwill or Eco Building Bargains in Springfield or some other end, end place for the material, so that we don't plan to end up with a pile of stuff that we have got to get rid of. That said, we've talked to people uh, again and they say that it's not unusual in the beginning that as people are going through this learning curve, there is a small amount of waste, and that's why David is, has budgeted a little bit of money for tipping fees for that kind of material. Um, but yeah, I think basically clear protocols, uh, trained volunteers, and clear guidelines are the way to, to achieve that sort of a goal. Mac, let me speak to the trained volunteers for one second. Uh, because of the events that we've been having for the last four years, uh, not only do we have trained volunteers that have been working at these events, but we're, we also have a mailing list of volunteers beyond that that we've been collecting at these events, people that are interested in getting involved in a, in a swap shop. So it's a, it's a growing list. Uh, it's dozens of people long, and that's what gives me the confidence that uh, we really have the core people that we need to have in order to make this successful. Yeah, and I, I, the last point I was going to make was that I think uh, we've talked a lot about the importance of starting small with this. And, uh, and then building it as we go along, depending upon how the community responds to it, depending upon what kinds of uh, volunteers, other volunteers emerge, what interests there are. For example, one of the things that goes on in other places is repair shops, where you, people bring in a broken lamp that needs to be rewired or something like that, and where initially we're not going to really be taking stuff that requires repair we're going to be on the lookout for people who can repair lamps or bicycles or whatever. And if they emerge as a dependable source resource, then we tend to, uh, we plan to have uh, workshops where we either repair those things for people or train them to repair them themselves. Um, 
we have several folks in our uh, our group that um, are particularly interested in the arts. Debbie Slavitt, who's here tonight, has had a lot of experience working with arts and connect arts and reuse together, and uh, she's particularly interested in <coughs> opening that up as a venue for bringing artists into it and maybe having things like art shows or uh, that sort of thing going out there. So so we're we're conscious of the fact that, uh, again, that we want to start it small, keep it simple, solve as many problems as we can as they come up, and then as we feel more established and we have uh, things, our, our protocols down, and we have our volunteers well trained, then we look to expand and see what other directions this can go in, because when you read about and talk to folks around the region, there are a lot of other activities that uh, um, have have come up to in conjunction with these kinds of uh, places. So, um, I, I, Susan, does everybody have a budget? No, I have them right here. Uh, so, we worked out a budget based upon best practices, speaking with uh, swap shops, actually speaking with the heads of DPWs in uh, municipalities, mostly in Massachusetts. Um, you know, one, one thread that runs throughout all of these swap shops is that they're really low-cost facilities. Um, if, if you look at the, the budget that's being passed around, uh, the, the, major, the two major costs in the first year are a volunteer coordinator and the building cost for getting the building at Glendale Road uh, up to speed. Um, as I said, I've started four or five uh, nonprofits in Northampton. Uh, Green Northampton was uh, was, a, was a flourishing one at one time, but we never had a volunteer coordinator. And the reason Green Northampton really is, is more abundant at this point is because we just didn't have anybody to, to uh, draft volunteers and keep that going. And I feel, because we know from best practices that having a, a core of volunteers and scheduling them and training them is going to be very important that if we had a little bit of money for, uh, for a part-time person just to hold that all together, that would be um, very helpful in making this thing work. Uh, there are some small expenses under operating expenses. Uh, the one that I'll, I'll bring to your attention is the largest disposal fees. As Mac was talking about, the one thing that every DPW had chuckled about was disposal fees. They said, you know, you, you can do your best and try and, and be a zero waste facility, but there's different levels of volunteers that are working. They have uh, different levels of experience, and uh, you're, you're bound to end up with more waste than you really think you're going to, even though we're intending to be a zero waste facility from day one. So we put a small amount of money in here for, and Susan, what does this represent? It represents uh, about 12 tons for the first year and eight tons thereafter. Um, the, one of the important differences between our swap shop and others that we've spoken to is that we're going to only take things for which we know that there is another end, end user um, possible. That's not the case with uh, some swap shops. In fact, there are some swap shops that are unattended completely, like the one in Leverett, Massachusetts. And people just leave stuff and um, it, it's much loved, I tell you. If you took that away from Leverett, you would probably have a, a, um, a riot. But um, it is unattended so that people leave stuff and it gets filled. And what they do is they just shut the doors. They don't even have um, regular people that, that are assigned. They just shut the doors and they say, it's a mess. We need a volunteer to clean it out. And the volunteer throws it all, so, you know, goes through stuff, pulls out stuff that needs to be trashed, and and the the um, town takes care of it. So, um, what was my point? My point was that we are going that's to have a screening process. That's not our plan. I mean, that is that's sort of our plan, but we're going to have a screening <coughs> process in front. My some of, I worked for many years for a chain of resale clothing stores that. Uh, bought used clothing from the public and, and turned around and uh, sold them again. And they, so there's a fine art of saying no to people, and it can be done nicely. Um, so, so we're going to say no a little bit more up front in hopes of having fewer disposal costs down the road. Um, 
there are some small operating expenses in here as well. Again, we've had these events over the last few years. We know that there are small things like wanting to buy coffee for the volunteers, like uh, office supplies, um, copying, perhaps a little bit of promotion uh, for, for an event or for the swap shop. But uh, those are very small uh, expenses. The, um, the, the largest expense is physical plan improvements, which would be to the building at Glendale Road. Uh, and Susan, that would come as a combination of materials, or th is that all materials, the 7,000? 7,000? Uh, I assume this is a, a working document it's for a projection. discussion. Yep. So um, I, it's hard to say how much of that would be materials. We're hoping to use a lot of reuse materials. Eco Building Bargains has said that they would make available um, some supplies that they have excess of for us to use to help uh, in line the inside of the facility. So we're trying to get, we're going to focus on reuse as much as possible. It's hard to say right now how much of this is going to be materials, how much of the 7,000 is material. Okay. Um, let me see. Under revenues, the DPW contributions, um, one of the things that uh, mm -hmm. All swap shops are covered by the municipality's uh, liability insurance, uh, so there's no additional insurance costs for something like that. Um, so in addition to to having, uh, I, as I understand that there's a ten thousand uh, dollar revolving fund that's been approved by the city council for was it the city council of the BPW that approved that city, city, council. city council. So um, uh, for expenses for a swap shop. And, and income through fund via fundraising and uh, use, user fees. So we. Like that. So, uh, one thing is that if if we are taking items for which we do not know of an another end user, we will charge a fee to take in that item. So if it's a a ten dollar disposal fee, then uh, th and that's how we hope to um, to really end up with as uh, as minimal as possible. Uh, disposal costs. Just to clarify that that we would not be taking in the money. It, the the gatekeepers at the transfer station, if it's say a sofa, well we won't take upholstered furniture, but say say it's a, a wooden chair for which there's a disposal fee at the at the transfer station, we would send the people, we'd say, you know, we'd love to take this. If it's if it's <coughs> questionable whether or not somebody would actually want it. We would say, you know, there is a disposal fee. We we need to. We're keeping our expenses low, um, so you will. We're, we're going to have to ask you to pay the disposal fee and bring it back to us, and then we'll happily take it for somebody else to use. But in case it doesn't, we're going to have to have you pay the disposal fee. So we're not going to be handling money. It's going to be the gatekeepers that would accept those fees. Um, I think we should open it up to questions. <coughs> Could you talk a little bit about the um, what you hope to do to the space? And does I, I haven't been inside. I, does it need lights? What does it need? Uh, Matt, why don't you? Well, it does need some lights. It's a little cave-like at this point, um, and it needs a, a cleaning. It has a good roof. Ned, Ned has told us. Um, it needs a little bit of work on the walls. I think we, we determined and. Uh, what, what am I? Asking? Well, we we made a vi we've made a couple visits and we've taken a bunch of pictures. The most critical thing is lighting, and the second critical thing would probably be to close it off from the elements. There are some holes up above, and some holes down below where animals and flying creatures can get in, and we'd like to close that off a little bit more. Um, and then the inside lines just aesthetically need to be uh, inside walls need to be um, finished in some fashion and. One idea that we've seen used that's really creative is to use, um, get a bunch of old doors. Um, I have pictures I can show you how this looks. It looks really great. Um, so you get a bunch of old doors which Eco Building Bargains can help us with. And instead of using uh, drywall or, or plywood, you, you've, you put doors up on the wall and then you paint them all the same color. So it's a very kind of artistic, fun look. So um, what, what's, what's the wall now? The wall is is just beams and corrugated. studs, corrugated. studs yeah, and metal. yeah, it's pretty. It's, oh, it's corrugated metal. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. really nothing yeah, much no to paint. If you just spray it white, would that? Mm. 
Um, well, it really uh, we when we first visited, it 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 really does need some kind of facing, most of it. Um, internal. 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 The, not the up, corrugated is external. Yeah. And so what you what the discussion is is about the making an internal wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David and I were just out at Saturday, so they did what you know, what was your impression it needs the very most? Well there's there's an old oil burning furnace in there that will have to come on it's clearly junk and probably we would have to get that out, out of the Or building. seal it off. Um, no, it well it it blocks off a corner and mm -hmm. it, it, there's no point in sealing it off. It's it's junk. It's metal fortunately. Mm -hmm. So we could that would, it. it's not a not a big deal. To get rid of, and there is electricity in into the space. You know, significant service. I, I don't. I, I think there's plenty of capacity, for, certainly for lighting, and also there there are a number of outlets on, on a wall of a kind of a bench space, long bench that could be used for demonstrating lamps or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they plug in, but but we have to have electric work done, which I believe the city is. Likely to contribute. There should be like like overhead lights that um, we, yeah. would, we could oh, potentially sure. even get them used from Eco Building Bargains. Um, so we just we essentially need light is the biggest thing, and then the door is a little um, precarious. So we would like some work done on the door so it can be closed properly. On the shaded portions of the budget are indicated um, contributions that hopeful Susan's hopeful that the DPW will make. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And then the total of them, the total of the shaded areas are in the revenue section as Solid Waste Enterprise Fund contributions. And, and when we were talking about the budget, Rose suggested um, having a, a uh, kind of a wish, wishful uh, possibility and then a bare bones possibility. And we didn't explore that too much except in the case of the volunteer coordinator. That's kind of our wishful piece um, that may or may not, I, I'm not sure how the $10,000 that was budgeted can be spent, but possibly some of that could be put towards or if the um, board can give some time from an employee to help uh, from an existing employee, um, a certain, you know, sometime perhaps to, to be the volunteer coordinator. There are lots of different ways we can do that, but uh, I wanted to explain that that was kind of um, a nice to have and a great to have, and if we can't have it, we'll be industrious and find a way to make it work. So I've been in conversation with Dave Palmer, and Central Services Director, about getting uh, the city electrician up there and take a look, we're going to have to bring the thing up to some form of code and compliance. Uh, we put in $10,000 for the FY15 budget, and I assume most of that was going to go into work on this building to bring it up to some reasonable code so okay. that it can be used for the, uh, the reuse facility. So we're waiting to hear from Dave. Yes. Here. What's the thought on the declining budget for the volunteer coordinator? Well, once once you have a your core of volunteers set, from all the uh, swap shops that we spoke to, it's it's the same people for years and years and years. So I think your volunteer you're going to need less uh, really finding people, yeah. and we're just maintaining a schedule. So you're proposing to spend about a hundred dollars a week on this volunteer? Well. David, having more business experience than us, and um, has had, had picked, uh, had had determined that amount. So I'm going to refer it to David. I don't. Um, yes, a hundred dollars a week. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's a seasonal right. operation. It will not. It's not heated. It will be closed in the winter. That's true. Right. So what is the season? Uh, I think it's eight months, right? It's uh, what was basically the around the beginning of April until around the end of October. Yeah. And I would point out that this is probably that if there were a paid volunteer coordinator, they would have to be under the auspices of the DPW, so there would be overhead costs and other um, responsibilities in terms of hiring someone because the 
the reuse center couldn't have their own employees independent of the DPW. No, but it could be a third party independent contractor. Is that right? Could be. Okay. Well, I have grand. Check my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's excellent. <laughs> That's another thing, actually, that really we need to get resolved. Um, I'd like to get sponsorship as quickly as possible for this, especially for the recreativity mm. aspect of the recenter, also the redistribution part of it. So, <clears throat> solving how we can feed our revolving fund is important to me right now. Or do we need to go to another third party like Green Northampton to to do that, <clears throat> and how much? endorsement does the city then give when there's a stop and shop thing support and a WHM, you know, local business is supporting this effort. There's probably money to be had with sponsorships, whether or not it works with the municipal framework that we have is another question and Ned and I are starting to pursue that. But it's a, it's a, it's a good idea for getting some other funding in. So I'm, I'm just kind of uh, thinking in my mind from a practical point of view, what can we do tonight? What decisions can we make tonight? You know, how can the board act in some way? Um, well, as I understand it, this isn't a, a one-step process uh, for the board. So I think... Unless you're ready for it to be one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, to do diligence, to come up with questions for us that, uh, that you think that perhaps we haven't answered yet. And um, and then to reconvene at the next Board of Public Works meeting and see if we can get this started. Can we just suggest the quickest possible way sure, to sure. make a decision on this stuff we can get going? Yeah. Deb's ready to uh, get to the artists. I'm ready to get to artists because here the the help, that the, the creativity we can get from the artists in this community. So the, the physical plant is important. Yes. We need a price. Um, now the money, this ten thousand dollars, is uh, not actually going to hit the system until July. Um, do we have to wait until then to make any expenditures? We'd have to take it out of our existing budget if we want to do something this year. But can it? Does that work, or is that actually? Mm, it oh. doesn't. I mean, you you asked that we put aside ten thousand dollars in the FY15 budget yeah. to assist us. That's what we've done. Yeah. There's money in our existing enterprise funds, but it wasn't allocated towards this. But it can be used if... Well, um, that's a question yeah, I'm asking. Like it can be used. In our last meeting, we talked about having a opening date potentially of July 1, which would allow us to ha be open a number of months before we close for the season. Given the fiscal kind of budget situation uh, that could certainly be pushed back but we could make a bunch of improvements on the site and then perhaps come July 1 quick put in the electricity <laughs> you know I mean it's all a, it's a project management question really um, so we could probably make it happen if it was difficult to, to have Mike that wants to volunteer is that right? <laughs> I'm going to volunteer a question <laughs> uh, do we have procurement issues that we have to struggle with even though there's relatively small amounts of money like procuring materials and even from the I'm Eco call building it, I'm gonna call it the restore but you yeah. can call it. <laughs> as far as security for you know working on the building itself that should be an issue the small dollar amounts okay that should be we have a threshold of ten thousand dollars fine okay and then the coordinator position could be a little more difficult that came up at our last meeting that we had last week, but I didn't know a lot that they were planning on this, and I've seen the budget for the first time tonight, so. Um, we have some part-time, I mean, the gatekeepers are part-time employees without benefits that is correct. pretty we straightforward. We fee for their services. So there might be something we could do that's similar. I, I don't think you would need the volunteer coordinator to get the reuse center off the ground on day one. There are so many volunteers that have been waiting so many years for this to happen. We can take advantage <laughs> be a lot of, of that momentum, yeah. So I think we'll be okay for a few months. There will be some important startup steps, especially around making clear the parameters of what kind of materials we're going to take and communicating that to the public. 
So there'll be some important signs, some um, kind of uh, lists and stuff for volunteers inside to help them kind of job aid type, type things. And those can be developed. Um, I can help develop those, and then we have uh, the volunteers can work on it too. But a volunteer coordinator would be great to have on board for that piece as well. So, Ned, can we... Um Can we come up with some clarity on whether we can spend any of the money ahead of mm -hmm. time? I'll look at that. I mean, I, I, clearly we don't want a, a legislative act to be required. No. But if it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you do this, you do that, and then reimburse it. Mm -hmm. It's the materials themselves that are going to we'd have to pay out if we're yeah. going to buy something this year, lighting. The electrician salary is already paid for in the FY14 and the FY15 budget. Right. Uh, the enterprise funds make a contribution to that employee, so it's a matter of getting finding the time to get them up there and getting some work done. So also, in the next two weeks, could we conceivably have some little cl more clarity from our point of view? Sure. About this, is that reasonable? Yeah. And the next reuse committee is June fifth. I believe so. So if we knew by that point. Mm -hmm. Well, sooner, well, we we would. We'll so I'm, I'm saying that we we talk on the 28th of August. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Next reuse is the 22nd of May. 22nd of May, because we just met. Yeah. Well, we, we decided we needed to have one before. Is that right? As yeah. I remember. It. Right. Right. Well, we can. Because I mean, we can hold a special meeting as well. I mean, we've been. We've also been hesitating making any announcements to the public mm -hmm. because uh, because there have been announcements made in the past and then nothing happened. So we wanted to make sure that we had the support of the board and Ned and and um, Jim before we made any big announcements. But one thing that would help is if you think that you are in support of the concept. If we could know soon, we can start putting the word out and getting the rest of the community excited about the prospect, too. That's the word, excited. I think we're tentatively, maybe, <laughs> in, in excited. support <laughs> of the... Uh, it's palpable. You're, you're from palpable. palpable. Uh, I can feel it. <laughs> Ned, uh, you're going to love it. <laughs> I, I have a question for Ned. Ned, you had mentioned when we had that meeting about having someone go over there and actually check it out and see what mm -hmm. it needed in terms of Right, that would be essential code. services. So it could be other things besides electricity. Well, that's the only thing that's going in the building. There's no heat in there that I'm yeah. aware of. So the only thing is power. Do we have to bring it up with a smoke detector or two in there? Mm -hmm. We no, might need the building inspector to take a look at that, it. That's what it sounded like. Right. There's a water code on site. The code for there's 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 Well, the code for public use. Yeah. yeah. Does the water get too often? No, anyway, I'm going to propose that we endorse the proposal that been the business plan that's brought to us tonight and um, uh, ask that Susan and Earl's staff. Um, confer with Ned on some of the particulars mm -hmm. and uh, put it on the agenda maybe again for the 28th to have an update. I'll second that. <laughs> hey. So we're, we're, lo <clears throat> we're looking to put some meat on the bone as far as this, what the building needs. I, I, and I can see that a lot of that effort has to come on our side. Mm -hmm. right. The right. building inspector has to look at it to see if he's what standard he's going to hold us to. I mean, this may or may not be, this may be short turnaround time, but we can at least start down the road. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's enough. What do you think, Karen? I'm, <clears throat> I'm only familiar with the building that's open, where you leave mm -hmm. TVs and mattresses and stuff. So is this, that has a dirt floor, as I recall? I don't think so. I think it's a concrete floor. Is I there have a pictures. Concrete? No, wait. There's a good concrete floor in mm -hmm. our 30 by Our section is the end, the, yes. end, the very end section. Yes. And that has a concrete floor. Okay. Some, some waviness to it. But, um, and then the rest is sand, actually. It's just a separate discussion. <coughs> sand and That's a separate discussion, Peter. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a separate <laughs> <laughs> 
be a separate question then, I guess. All right, so the motion on the table is to voice our support for the general direction, and we're agreeing to reconvene in a couple of weeks, hopefully with uh, some clearer answers on our side as far as when any work could start, what the scope of that work might be as far as the building is concerned. And do we agree that getting the space open is the biggest thing, the biggest step at this point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all in favor of that general proposal? Aye. 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 So, you have our unanimous <coughs> of support. Excuse me. Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. Now, you know, we've had a lot of people come before us with ideas for this or that, and um, it's, it's impressive to see a big group with multiple people presenting different pieces of the puzzle, and everyone, you have worked on this for so long. Well, I have to say, Susan has really made a point of getting as many people to step up and take parts of it as opposed to her running the show, so she gets a lot of credit for that. Because she's only part-time, remember? <laughs> <laughs> I can crack the whip. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, now it's now we're into the good stuff. National Public Works Week. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So right behind you, Terry, is the new poster for next week, National Public Works Week. Yeah. Um, I can't make a city council meeting for the mayor's proclamation for night, but Jim is going to my place as a family obligation. Uh, next week we're doing tours on Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. of the water treatment plant, the wastewater treatment plant, flood control, and the barns. That's also on our blog at this point too. So, a little bit of excitement here. Little. Um, all right. Very good. Nice to um, Next on our agenda tonight was a discussion about pavement projects in 2014. And I'll turn that over to Jimmy. So at the last meeting, uh, we distributed a memorandum. Um, which I think I just can't draft. If I didn't, I probably should have, based on the comments the board members had. Um, but we sent, uh, so we provided a sort of a summary memorandum and a list of um, paving projects that we were looking at for FY15. Uh, and the idea was to have the board review the contents of the memo and let me know if they had comments about the contents of the memo or the streets and our rationale for picking the streets that were picked for improvement. Um, I have since had uh, individual communications with uh, Mike and Terry um, and realized that there's some things in this memorandum that are not there that should probably be in there relative to schedule and more clearly articulating how we actually selected the streets that we selected. So there was some loose um, references to the VHB roadway asset management model that we use. And we also mentioned the fact that we used our brains and some other things that we did, um, which we thought was all good, but not quite enough in terms of the public being able to get from point A to point B, which is specifically why did you pick Sylvester Row, why did you pick North Main Street, you know, why did you pick Jackson Street. So, um, and in the process, skip over other streets that in theory should be higher priorities. Right. So there were some streets on the VHB tables which people had noticed were um, had a higher benefit value than some of the streets that we picked. So some of those rationale need to be described um, better in this in this uh, memorandum. So we're proposing to come back in two weeks with a with an updated memo that has more information about schedule and, and the rationale. Um, we would started to work on the memo based on some of the comments that we received at the last meeting. Um, our former member, Chris Hellman, had a good comment about trying to provide some technical description about what you know, an overlay is, what a reclaim project is, what a rubberized chip seal is, etc. So we, we started to work on some of those things, and um, it still needs work. So if people have other ideas, I'd be happy to hear them. Otherwise, we'd shoot to get a memo out um, to everybody before the next board meeting, so you have a chance to take a look at it. I'm thinking about your protection. 
so I might be out of bounds on this. But that you, the purpose of, of this is to, uh, it's for information purposes and not maybe decision making purposes. Or something to do a way that, that if, if we're trying to get, we're trying to explain all the different factors that are going into this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's open for negotiation. Um, you know, it's, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, because in part we're writing this for the board, mm -hmm. but one of the things that we're trying to do is, is trying to describe why we're selecting the streets that we are. Right, right. So it should be decision-making criteria that are listed in there. Okay. Um, and so people, so anyone could read it and follow how we got to the list. Yeah. Right? Seems right. pretty basic. Right, right. We haven't exactly accomplished that, and it's a little bit complicated because we can't just, we're not just saying that we're using a model only. We're saying we're using information and data from a model and we're also using inspection of the street by our, by our own staff, by Rich and Dave Letter, and, and we're weighing other things like planned utility improvements in streets and things that don't show up on the asset management system that's for pavement only. But So what we're trying to do is be able to describe the list with some clarity uh, in terms of how we got to the list. So um, some of the criteria are more technical and some of them may be deemed a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. um, when I was talking to Terry today, actually, I thought his, uh, he made a comment in, uh, about the whole private way process. Well, we started out with sort of a list of criteria, and then as we went along, exactly. we realized that the criteria, the criteria were a really good guide, right. but sometimes there were things that weren't quite criteria. They were a little more subjective, if mm -hmm. you will. So um, this may be like that, mm -hmm. um, because there were some things that might be a little more, could be deemed to be a little more <coughs> subjective, because we're just not saying... We went to the model and we picked the top three. You know, we could, you know, you could do that, but we don't feel that's in the best interest of what we're trying to accomplish. Exactly. I think a caveat might be, you know, some explanation along those lines. Right. And so the, the other part of it, in terms of communication, this was originally written as a memo to the board, mm -hmm. but it's really more intended to be a communication piece for the general public, not only so that the board can understand what we're doing mm -hmm. and what the schedule is and how decisions were made, but also we could make this available um, for residents to look at and say, okay, well, these are the streets that are going to be worked on. These are the months that they're going to be working on those. This is how they were picked. So they can see the, the picture of what we're doing. We're spending like $2 million this year, so being able to describe how we're spending it is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, this, the, the amount we're going to spend on pavement is the same size as the Stormwater Enterprise Fund, mm -hmm. which is going to require many workers and you know, a lot's going to happen. And so <clears throat> it seems reasonable to me, and I have suggested that we should be able to articulate our goals for this pavement season. Here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're going to do it. Here's when we're going to do it. So someone who is sitting on the street that's in dire need of work can read the document, see, wow, okay, looks like I'll be September, October. Um, we're waiting for the, you know, at the moment that's out to bid. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm on the list or I'm not on the list because of this and that. I I think that's not unreasonable. Um, there's a bit of mystery about the streets. Like, why are we doing this street? Why are we doing that street? And I think we could take that mystery out mm -hmm. for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if if there's a conversation about, well, I don't entirely agree with your rationale. At least we've expressed our rationale. There's the basis of a discussion there. And I don't think any of us would be adverse to being persuaded for next season that we should approach a little bit differently. I, I think that's uh, we could stake out what we're thinking and put that in writing and, and give it to people. There could be some policy matters that, that come up for board consideration for future lists, right? I, mean, I think that'd be great. Yeah. And that's where we should be focusing our energy, you know, not, mm -hmm. not whether or not we do this year or that street. I don't think that's staff decision or staff recommendation. Right. I, think, I mean, a, a policy makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there, and there are some policy decisions that go in it, like the benefit value calculation. One of the factors is is the traffic count on the street, right? And, and when you crunch a number, depending on how much value you put on the number of traffic counts, you're making a decision about whether you're going to pave a busy street or a street that doesn't see as much traffic. So even when you look at the benefit value calculations and how they're calculated, I mean, it's a, an equation that's made up. So how you make it up has an impact on what street you're paying for, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when I look at that, 
some of those things could be board policy decisions, right? And how do you steer the money that you have mm -hmm. in a way that's reflective in, in the asset management plan? Mm -hmm. Do we weight the center or central part <coughs> of the city higher than so the Sylvester Road area? Well, and the other thing, when we talk traffic, we're only talking about cars. We're not talking about bicycle traffic, are we? It's vehicle counts. Vehicle counts. So that's automobiles, trucks. No, they, they count. Bicycles count. Do they count? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we could, as a matter of policy, uh, give some priority to roads that are um, likely bike path or get heavy bike use. Mm -hmm. I mean, th there are, as Jim says, there are potentially little uh, policy issues intertwined here. and But we can't get at that until we pull it out and examine what's happening. Right. We may not even know what the issues would be. Yeah. Uh, this isn't entirely relevant, but we've been talking about street sweeping. And for years, I've known that we rotated through the wards. We, if we did ward four first this year, it'll be last, or it'll be second to the, we rotate. It rotates around where we start, and then we just go through the wards. Well, if you dig, if you dig into that for a moment, you think about it, we actually do the mains first. Route 9, King Street, Pleasant Street, South Street, maybe, you know, I mean, you have to think about, well, all right, if we're going to do the Main Street, which are the mains? And, you, and, and that's first. And then it, it turns out we do the schools early in the process also. Um, and then we start going through the smaller streets and neighborhoods. But it's just, it's interesting to pick it apart and see if we could write down what is our approach, what's the rationale. And so for years, as I say, I've been like, oh, okay, we wrote that. But when you really stop and think about it, I think, well, we could probably be a little more precise than that. Um, so we wake you up at 4 a.m. this year. It's my turn next year. Yeah. And it turns out we also circle back to the mains. Is that right, Rich? Yeah, the way. Here we go. Aren't you glad you came? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this, but this yeah, is why I think we need no, to get this down just, on a piece no, of paper. No, I mean, it, street sweeping is really... Street sweeping is an interesting operation. Uh, it's last year. I'll just tell you, we swept with two people, one operator, one truck driver, which is unheard of because we don't we have enough staff. So in order for us to have enough staff to do all the other jobs, were tree work and potholes and everything else. I, I uh, only had two people sweeping, and it took them from April 1st until September to do the whole city, which is way too long, in my opinion, to provide services and also to. Um, just sweep. I mean, in general, there's a lot of the things we have to do. So we do have two street sweepers and a truck driver. But typically, you're correct. What we end up doing is we do um, we do the schools during the April vacation because there's no students there. It gives the school department a chance to go ahead and sweep out all their corners, sweep off all their lawns from all the debris, and we sweep them. Hopefully, before the April vacation, we have already started sweeping, and we typically do downtown, uh, Florence Center, and Leeds Center uh, at night. When there's no one, when there's no one around because of traffic, and then we will do some of the mains, but we typically don't do all the mains through the whole city at one time because it would take forever. Because like Florence Road, which is actually very long, very time-consuming, so it's not fair because you're bouncing around all over the place, and you've told people in Ward Four you're going to be there at May first, and you're not there till July first. So we typically do the large mains where it have all the heavy traffic downtown and Florence and Leeds get swept probably every two to three weeks. And then we have another route, which is, which is a truck route, which is we, we sweep Damon Road, Bridge Street, uh, Bridge Road, uh, King Street, Pleasant Street. So there's streets that are constantly cleaned all the time. But in this same time, we sweep the wards as well. So there's a lot of, and we, the other problem is, is that we have, we had, uh, we have a staff person who works 11 to 7 who was on long-term workers' comp issue we're trying to resolve that issue but that is the person that does a lot of the nighttime sweeping that wakes you up so this year you have a little bit of or you have a little bit of reprieve uh, but doing work for it but I think you're right I think it would be interesting because I think people don't I think that's one of the things that general public doesn't understand is a lot about our operations because that I spent a lot of time ask, uh, answering questions from residents well why do you pick snow at night why don't you do, do it during the day um, you know Greg Nolan has the same issue why are you flushing pipes in the middle of the night why do you have to repair that water main now, you know? And it's just that people don't, there's no document that's really available for people to readily see that the Department of Public Works does A, B, and C operations for A, B, and C reasons. 
So I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea to to have that. It's really great for everyone to understand operations, I think. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. So my point in bringing up the street sweeping is I think more and more I'd like to start documenting what we're doing and, and making it available to the public. So when someone calls me up from Coles Meadow Road wondering, is, is this a year? Is it going to happen this year? We can just, I, you know, it's on, the, it's on our thing. Even I might, would, I might have to refer to it to say, well, I don't know, but let's, let's take a look at this. And it's right there. September 3rd. We'll be there. Uh, okay. Great. So we'll look forward to uh, talking about this next time. Yeah. It'll be fun. I it promise. Oh, yeah. We may not have cupcakes, but it'll be fun nonetheless. <laughs> they may well, then, they may still be here. <laughs> <laughs> then let's talk about Pulaski Park. Oh, we got some water questions for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. We are working on uh, on a billing system, and it's going swimmingly. We've got some uh, some of the database back from CDM, and we're going through a quality control check on their impervious area calculations. In the meantime, our crack clerical staff are going through parcel ID entry for existing and future customers, and it will all happen for bills to be issued by July 1st, right, Beach? Yeah. It's going to be a big party. Yeah. We'll be done. Yeah. I can't wait to get my own bill. So I'll make I sure have a special one for you. We'll make, sure <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure it happens. That's that's the update for most of oh, oh, and the other thing is we're working on uh, requests for proposals, right? Because we've got capital projects in the budget and we're trying to get engineers lined up and on board so when July comes we'll be ready to start some of the projects. Because my hope is at the end of the first year, when we go back in front of city council, we can tell them all the great progress we made. Because we have to go in front of them, right, and give them an update. Yeah. So it would be embarrassing to say we just didn't really, didn't kind of, didn't get around to it after all that work with a new ordinance. <laughs> Sorry, we were busy. Can we encumber three quarters of the money? We'll, we'll get to it next year. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid that. Um, okay, that sounds great. And it, your impression is that city halls, Munis stuff is under control and at 722 tonight it is totally under control I mean it's been a little rocky right I mean you're trying to we're trying to do a, a new thing here but it's going well and we're, we have faith it'll be done <laughs> okay I give my angry face <laughs> that helps Donna Sibela is uh, <laughs> available available I think we could bring her in uh, <laughs> Um, okay, now we can talk about the Pulaski Park update. Um, I think I probably talked about this last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so the next uh, session for the workshops is May 22nd, so next Thursday from 6 to 8. I had a meeting with um, Stephen Stimson and Lauren Stimson on Friday afternoon uh, last week, and uh, they're starting to, to take the ideas from the seven workshop design groups um, from the first meeting and there's actually a lot of things in, that were in common, a lot of, a lot of uh, aspects of the park that people either liked or knew things that they wanted were, were sort of in sync, right? So they're, they're coming up with a way to get a lot of those things together on a preliminary plan that they'll present at the next meeting and then try to get further input on uh, what, people, what people like about sort of the synth synthesis of the ideas. Um, which has led me to the basic question of, I think the process has been great so far, but I'm wondering about the board's involvement. Um, Mike went to the first meeting and kind of was uh, an observer of what was happening, and it was a really great process. People were really, really thankful for the ability to, to be able to communicate what they like about the park. I've got a, a number of email from residents and, and things um, that we're also taking into account, and I'm sending that information to Stimson. And there's going to be, there will be a plan, obviously, and the board played a pretty significant role a few years ago in the design competition and the selection of Stimson, but um, I'm not really sure how, if, if you want to vote on the plan or if you just want to, I, I'd be happy to present the plan as it goes along. Um, I don't obviously have anything tonight because I haven't got anything from Stimson, but um, I'm happy to come in front of the board and, and show you specifics about what they're doing. 
uh, wasn't really clear to me. We never outlined a process. We have a process with Stimson in our contract, three public meetings, they come up with a final plan, bid documents, and then we're ready to go. But beyond that, um, there wasn't, wasn't anything specific from the board. I would like to hear updates. I, I totally am committed to going to move, but I'm having some commitment issues at work, so mm -hmm. I, can, I have to divide my life up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. I mean, Mike went as an observer, and I, and I have to admit, when I was there, I did nothing to. I mean, and I'm a resident. I have a lot of thoughts about what I'd love yeah. to see in the park, but because I'm the person managing the project of the city, I felt a little awkward going around and like saying, "Oh, you should really put a large fountain there," or, you know, whatever, right. whatever my own, yeah. whatever, whatever. Well, we can discuss it here. Yeah. 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 So we'll do that after the next workshop. We'll have information. We can talk okay. more specifics. <coughs> Ned, you only, you look like you almost had a, a, a thought. No, I just had to cough. Yeah. Okay. Um, super. Thank you, Jim. Maybe you'd like to talk about the Water Department DEP Water System Award. What I ever? Yeah. Won. I had the greatest <laughs> day last week. You did. Greg Nullman and I went to Sharon to shake the hand of the Commissioner of DEP, and he gave us this fancy. Award, which says that our public water system uh, had outstanding performance and achievement in 2013. So um, we were in the medium to large community category. I think there were six um, cities and towns in that category uh, across the state that um, received this award. So the award is, I don't have any prepared notes. Oh, but don't let me forget about this. Deval Patrick, our governor, also gave us a commendation, which I'll read because you, you asked. That's uh, what you do. That's what I do, right? It says, on behalf of the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I'm pleased to confer upon you this governor's citation and recognition of your dedicated service in maintaining a safe and abundant supply of clean water and an appreciation of your commitment to protecting this valuable natural resource. Deval L. Patrick, governor, this sixth day of May in the year 2014. So. A lot of hard work goes in. They don't just hand these out. I mean, we haven't, you know, they're, they're hard to get. And I think it's a real credit to the, uh, the people in the water department that um, maintain a system that's in compliance with all the regulations. And some of the things that we do beyond mere compliance with the regulations is what sort of gets you into the category of getting an award. Some of the asset management planning that we've done, participation in state programs for water conservation devices and, um, uh, there was an effective utility management program that, that we took that was sponsored by, by EPA. So some of these things that we do that show that we're trying to do more with the water system and manage it in a smart way is what sort of gets you to the tier where you might get an award. So it was good. Greg and I went and we were happy to happy to deal with those. We mentioned in the Gazette yesterday about it. But, mm -hmm. but you know, it's really everybody that works in the water department that, um, that makes these things, you know, happen. and. Uh, we mentioned in the in the blog that Dave Sparks was obviously the person at the helm in 2013 as the water superintendent. So a lot of the yeah a lot of the credit goes to him. Obviously he's not the superintendent anymore, but a lot of his hard work and it was multiple years of his good work that really led to us getting the award. So that was it. It was fun. I just did you have to apply for this or was that out of the blue? Uh, no, you, no, it's a, an award program that DEP does every year, and you don't have to apply. They go through um, an evaluation of all the public water systems in a variety of categories. And that's more admirable, I have to say. Good stuff. Um, Gary, was there anything we didn't talk about that you wish we had? Oh, where to start? I, I, you mentioned David Sparks. I know he's doing the cross connection <clears throat> stuff, and that's a private. I mean, he's, he has a contract to do that. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. Does he still work for the city, though? Or is that he does? But just you couldn't do the superintendent work and do this. Uh, that's right. Do, but does he work for the DPW? He yes. does in the water department. Yes. Okay. So we brought that project in house. But he's still doing it as a contract. No. Isn't that was the no. other guy. Oh, that's we right. He was training him. He's out on the train. Tom McCarthy was training yeah. him. Oh. But didn't Dave retire? No. 
If, if, he retire, if he retired, if he retired, then I'm something. I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but he's no longer the superintendent. That's, That's correct. correct. But at least he's still here, and he can probably have fabulous resources. He is. Okay. Anything else? That was it. Okay. Could we get a copy of Dick's comments? Yes. Thanks. Can I get him back? Next meeting, uh, I have my notes here that Kevin Howard's going to be here to present the water management asset plan. Uh, I think we've blocked aside an hour for that, just so you're prepared okay. for that if you okay. forgot about it. Um, John Carver, who's our chief operator of the wastewater treatment plant, is retiring next month. Uh, we just did an announcement, and you have it in your board package tonight, that Jim Zimmerman is promoted uh, to that from the pre treatment coordinator position. He's been down there since, I think, 1980 working at the plant. John's retiring after 37 years of service to the community. Wow. So he came up under uh, Jim Dostal? He did. Hmm. He did. Um, there is an informal uh, get-together at JJ's up here at the Silk Mill, uh, what was Silk City Brewery, whatever it's called, uh, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, those are interested. Just a little get-together. The Tate and Howard presentation is in June. 25th. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. The one for next, the next, the one for the next board meeting was the one with Mike. Yeah, oh, I'm so sorry about that. that. Yeah. So you get you get time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I don't have. Uh, I have nothing. Okay. And more. Jim, thank you, Jim. I have nothing else. I thought that the no city got a five-star sustainability award. Did anyone else see that? I saw that in the paper. Yeah. You know, sustainability includes what you're doing with your infrastructure, too. And I was wondering if you were any part of that. And Which award was that? should be. The Five Star <laughs> Community Award. That was, was it EPA? Uh, it was the STAR program. Yeah, yeah, yeah we were part of that. Wayne was plugging the heck out of me for stuff on that. He was killing sustainability me. Sustainability tracking. Yeah. He's got a little thing in his email. This is what STAR Community. Yeah, we were. Oh, he's already got. He's got there in his footer. Nice. Yeah, he's really. He's really good. Um, we were a part of that. Actually, we had a. We had to answer a lot of questions about water and wastewater systems um, and how we manage them and compliance and there were, there were you know actual data reports and things. There was a lot to it. But yeah. Well, I just wanted you guys to get credit for that also. Thanks, MJ. <laughs> Was that in the paper yet, or it was? I saw it on the mayor's. Uh, it was on the website. Oh, okay. that's where I saw it. Oh. Was it in the paper? Um, I think it was just do that. I thought it. Yeah, I saw it somewhere, but okay. I, I thought that you guys that it wasn't. The infrastructure is a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that you were getting credit. Was acknowledged. I hadn't actually heard that we, we were awarded no, that. No, we didn't. Just made the green. I guess it's also. Oh, the green. It was going down. And then my other, one other question, who's his resignation? Is he, come, uh, he has committee assignments, and who's going to pick up his, his slack? Someone's got to step up for the tree committee. I think, I think the chair always has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 we've got to get sorry. someone in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, here's the deal. Um, uh, the mayor said that anyone who uh, we think might be a good candidate or who might be interested needs to go through the process of filling out the paperwork at City Hall. Mm -hmm. um, or online. Yeah, uh, or online. Um, Ned and I talked about it briefly. Um, for example, there was a seat on the board that was kind of like the lawyer's seat, mm -hmm. and there's the banker's seat. Mm -hmm. I think that was in some years back. Um, I think what has been most valuable is to have people who are willing to dig into the contracts and look at them the way that Mike mm -hmm. does, mm -hmm. people who have, um, you know, a, a better handle on what it is that's happening, mm -hmm. uh, a little more of a technical or an engineering mm -hmm. background, um, who or who are interested in aspects like the, the reuse committee, you know, mm -hmm. like kind of excited about digging into mm -hmm. things we work on. So I don't see it as necessarily being someone who is got a law degree or an accountant that we need. I think we mostly... Bring something to the table. 
or or is interested in yeah. getting involved. I, mean, I think that's probably more useful in the long run. But if you can think of anybody, I've had a couple be. people approach me like they want to know who else is on the would also like a board member who would fill potholes in the spare time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought that would be good. Or with, well, with a, a heavy equipment driving license. Yeah, yeah. So we, could, we, could help with, license. we could help with the qualifications. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we should get someone as soon as possible. Otherwise, we're going to have to draw straws for the tree committee. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on it already once. When I was on the planning board, there used to be associate members of the planning board, and it was really helpful because then when there was a vacancy on the planning board, they sort of understood sort mm -hmm. of how the thing operated. It was, wasn't that steep of a learning curve for them to step into. So you're saying since... Huh? No, I was a... Uh, Mayor Musanti appointed me to be an associate member of the Cable Advisory Board. So I was a non-voting member of a board that could advise the cable company. I think it was Charter or it was oh, a, yeah. Steve. But well, and they would say board. no. They would routinely say no, we can't do that. No. So this was a committee that had no teeth and I was a non-voting member. It was uh, okay. So best you know, I don't know, that would be a charter change or something. Uh, it? I, it, it just I when I was on the planning board I thought it was very junior members. Well and just the, I mean, the amount of technical and sort of financial information that we have to come up to speed on here in this room, I think it's daunting sometimes. Mm. One thing that we've been blessed to with the board is longevity. Everyone seems to save quite a bit of time here. And maybe those uh, boards that have junior members or non-voting members because they have circulation mm -hmm. every two, three, four years. Do you think the board is big enough? I think, the nice yeah, I think if it were any size. bigger, we'd need a, another room. <laughs> and no facility. <laughs> or they, they wouldn't be able to have all their, <laughs> new chairs. Right That's why I signed up again. No. I'm going to work on it. Um, all right. Well, so we're looking for ideas if anything comes to mind. Uh, me, I've got uh, nothing. So, uh, they, uh, oh, David, I'm sorry. On the reuse committee, I just wanted to point out that the gatekeepers, the, you know, the people that are there now, are an integral part of this operation, and they seem to be very much tuned into the same philosophy as, as the volunteers. Mm -hmm. and I, 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 they, they, they're just automatic cooperation at this point. It seems to, to be going very well. It seems like a sharp group, and they're clearly excited about this. I just like to get out of the way and let them go. Yeah, and tenacious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know I've said it once before, but I'll say it again: professionalization process. I mean, they've really grown in professional capability. Is this does this building have the potential to do what they need? To start. I think it's okay to start. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to serve their needs five years down the road from now, but it's a good starting point for okay. It's the right price. <laughs> yeah, all right. It's a uh, great address. How, how big is the building? It's well, this small. I think they just said it was 30 by 30 they measured it. Yeah, so it's almost 900 square feet. All right, that's a good size. That's what's enclosed. Yeah, but this is 900 yeah, square feet. These are the two dumpsters that are in the yeah. concrete pit. I don't go to the dump. I have people for that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Maybe you should volunteer for the board and learn what really goes on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, motion to adjourn. All right, thank you.